Today's date is Tuesday, March 13th, and this is Nevertheless She Composed, a contemporary video anthology of women composers of the 21st century, and uh, I'm just so excited for today's interview. I'm excited for all of them, but I'm really happy to interview my dear friend, composer Kara Haxo. Hey, Kara. Hi. <laughs> so glad to have you uh, on NSC today, um, and... Uh, just in nevertheless she composed is um, a web series and we're just celebrating women composers and uh, and everything that comes along with them in their lives so Kara why don't you op open it us up tonight and just uh, give us a little introduction of yourself well so I am Kara um, I am current I'm a composer uh, <laughs> I am currently a doctoral student at the University of Oregon in Eugene where I studying composition and also music theory. Uh, I'm from Massachusetts originally, the western half. And yeah, that's what I currently do. Awesome. Uh, I had the privilege of heading out west a couple of years ago and got to pop in uh, and visit with you at the University of Oregon. Absolutely gorgeous out there. Um, and we're gonna, we'll definitely talk more about um, about your time there at Oregon. So, um, Kara, the format of these interviews have been very simple: past, present, and future, so that we can get sort of a landscape, a portrait of your life in general, and uh, all things in the past and those great things to come. So, um, why don't you take some time and tell us, you know, about your education and go back whenever you want to go back, but, you know, tell us where you came from. How'd you get to where you are? <laughs> okay, um, well, I'm, as I said, I'm originally from Massachusetts. Um, I actually, I didn't start piano lessons until third grade, which I guess is kind of late for some people, but before that, I did ballet and I had parents who really loved music and so I listened to a lot of actually a lot of Mozart opera with them so I think music was always a part of my life and then in third grade I stopped taking ballet because my teacher quit and so did I. Um, <laughs> I switched over to piano lessons at that point uh, with a family friend uh, who was very generous in fostering my creativity so when I started making up my own music and showing an interest in some of the theoretical side of things shortly after she was really supportive of that so I started um, I basically remember like making up tunes almost as soon as I started understanding how notation worked wow. uh, and I had this one memory of drawing my own staff so that I could write down a melody uh, yeah. and after that I was like oh we probably need to like get her staff paper um, but I think my, my big thing happened when I was 12, I, my mom found this program called the Walden School in Dublin, New Hampshire, which is a camp focused specifically on composition, it's more of like a music school, and it's five weeks in Dublin, New Hampshire, it's focused on composition, musicianship, uh, choral singing, and I, she encouraged me to apply, and I really didn't want to, but I did apply, <laughs> and then I got in, and I was upset that I got in. Um, so I tried to find ways of not going, and eventually none of those worked out. So I went and ended up falling in love with it, and I went back for six, well, I went for a total of six summers as a student, so from when I was 12 until I was 17. Um, and that became like the big foundation of my musical training, because I'd go there for five weeks every year. Um, my musicianship got really strong. Their whole philosophy is um, learning through creativity and through creating and improvising. Uh, so it's a very hands-on method. I, I work there now as faculty, so that's cool. Um, yeah. yeah, so I went there. After that, I was pretty sure I wanted to keep doing composition. So I attended the College of Worcester in Ohio, a small liberal arts school. I studied there with Jack Gallagher and studied composition for the four years I was there. And then from there, I went straight to my master's at Butler University, which is how we met. <laughs> so I met Michael Shelley there. Uh, <laughs> And from there, I went straight here to Oregon to study with Rob here and uh, David Crumb. So I've been through a lot of school recently. <laughs> so much school and all from.
from one end of the country to the other, and I uh, can't wait to highlight some of your adventures in between there. Um, so yes, you, you mentioned um, that we met at Butler University. Uh, were we just there, I think you were, were we there a year? Yes. A year yes. One year, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was trying to remember, and I thought it was, it felt way too short. <laughs> so, um, I think it was 2014 in the fall, and I graduated that spring. Right, right, yeah. Um, and our time together at Butler, even though it was short-lived, it was so wonderful, and I was so appreciative of um, your passion and your drive, and in your music is so well put together. It's beautiful and it's it's so well designed. And and I had the opportunity to uh, conduct your piece red, mm -hmm. yeah, for your recital. And I just it was such a great experience. Um, and so I would I hope that we get a chance to talk about what makes some maybe we can talk about what makes a great experience from composer to conductor to musicians you know because you're actually you're, I felt like you're just really strong in that area um, your rehearsals were enjoyable so <laughs> um, yeah so we had a we did have a good time together at Butler um, so what were you know what were some of the significant uh, things maybe at your time at Worcester or at Butler or in your past. What what was do you have any favorite moments? Oh, um I think putting together both of my recitals, both at Worcester and at Butler, were maybe the recitals themselves. I think looking back on it, the rehearsals were also really enjoyable. I think I was usually like very stressed out leading right. back to that. Um but Actually, I mean, honestly, even at Oregon, too, I think putting together recitals has become one of my favorite things, just because I am, well, first of all, you get to hear your music performed, and you can learn a lot from that, both in good ways, and you can learn things that you need to work on for the future, and that's always good, um, but I think it's, it's just so cool how generous people are with their time, and how you realize, like, what sort of musical community you're in and how people are generous and they're interested and I've had, uh, I maybe I've just been really, really lucky in the places where I ended up and the people I've interacted with, but it makes me feel so much closer to like the musical communities I'm in mm -hmm. and that has been a really rewarding experience That's um, in all three places. Yeah, well that's an interesting topic right there because when I think of you, you know, I think about um, what a, a wonderful person you are to work with, not just personality-wise, but your professionalism as a composer, your preparedness, I thought that was really excellent, and those are things we really have to think about, you know, um, you, we should really focus on our musicians, and you're, you're an, such an expert at putting together wonderful recitals, your master's recital blew my mind, it was so excellent, and I hope, you know, we'll figure out some ways to uh, highlight some of that however you want to but you're um, it was just excellent and I just wish I could have been well I better not spoil the surprise but you just had another big recital <laughs> I'm gonna let you talk about that um, but yeah the one thing I remember about your master's recital um, was was that you incorporated something kind of pretty special do you want to do you want to talk about that your father's work Oh, yes. Yeah. That. Uh, so, yeah, my dad is an artist, uh, which I think has played a big role in my life. He, uh, I've always been surrounded by artwork. My mom is also very artistic, and they're both teachers, too, which has also, I think, influenced where I am today. Sure. Uh, but, yeah, I really enjoyed recently. It started, I think, Mostly when I was at Butler that I started. My dad recently has been doing a lot of uh, digital imagery and doing, he, he, his main medium is sculpture, but he's been interpreting that as 3D sculpture on the computer. And through that, he's also started doing like videos of like really just moving around and looking at these sculptures in different perspectives, but it makes them look animated. Sure. So I was taking some of time composition lessons with Frank Felice, who's the other uh, composition professor at Butler, and he we had talked about one of the pieces I was working on, and he was like, oh, this would be really cool if you could maybe like incorporate a video with it. Uh, so I wrote to my dad, I was like, hey, can I use some of your artwork? And he said yes. Uh, so um. it just happened. It, originally, they weren't going to be together, but when I put like the trial along with like no expectations, they already started to line up really well. So then it was just a 
working with his art since I've always liked it and this was like a new perspective on it to actually be working with it. Uh, and he says, I know, I really, I want to do more art. I haven't done as much electronic composition since I've been at Oregon, wherever I am now. Yeah. Um, but I <laughs> yeah, where are we? <laughs> a lot of solo and like small ensemble things. I think it would be really cool to maybe pair some solo instruments with some of his videos in oh. order to go with videos. Uh, since I feel like that, you could still time really well. So that might be on the agenda for something. I know he has actually been listening to some of my recordings that I've had recently and has been trying to pair some oh. of his art with my recordings, so from the other side. Oh, cool. Uh, so there are a lot of options there. Uh, I've also, this isn't as much in the recital, but I've been, he has been doing this, he has an iPad, and from his very first iPad, we've got this dinky little drawing program that was free. Um, and he has since created like all sorts of beautiful iPad artwork with that, just oh. like scribbling with his finger, which if you go on my website, there's a shameless plug for yep. that, all of the artwork I have on there are different ones from his dinky, cheap little iPad program. Wow. Um, which he actually, he currently, he still has the same iPad he's had for years because that program won't, won't work on newer ones. So oh. he doesn't want to give it away. Oh, <laughs> I still follow your father um, online and Facebook and everything. I, I just enjoy his art so much. It's just very unique, and it must fall in line with something inside of me because I just I really enjoy it and uh, check in on him still after all this well, time. I, well, I find he usually posts the pictures, and I haven't for a while, but that's on my agenda of things. I have a whole slew of new ones to post. At oh, that point. wait, great. Oh, uh, I, actually, I think we we call them Dad. That's Tom Haxo. Oh yeah, Thomas uh -huh. Haxo, <laughs> A.K.A. Dad. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, yeah, well, absolutely, uh, the one feature of the NSC series, for those of you tuning in, is um, at, at the bottom of, um, for example, Kara's page on NSC, anything that we talk about, if they have any kind of web presence whatsoever, we uh, link to that, and so um, if you hear Kara talk about something and you're interested in that, you can just go in underneath the video there and look at the bottom, and, and everything is linked in chronological order of what the where it was discussed in the interview so um and maybe opening up some avenues for other organizations other artists other musicians to get some uh, airtime so that great um well i just uh i i wanted to make sure we talked about that um i thought that recital was just amazing and so um let's go on to the present so i know you have big news about what's been going on in your life so i'm going to go right ahead tell us what's happening in your world well i just had another recital yes uh, my doctoral recital was february 18th so a little under a month ago right even though it feels I, like it was a lot longer ago oh really i yeah yeah oh it feels like i don't know i think so i got back from winter break and i started rehearsals pretty like it was basically like rehearse until then and then since then I've had no rehearsals and so I think because of that it feels like it's really far away. Sure. Um, but yeah, it was it was really fun. Uh, I had eleven pieces on my recital, I think, if I'm counting correctly. Oh my uh, most, most of my pieces tend to be happen to be like five minutes. Sure. But saying eleven pieces I still need it was sixty minutes of music, give or yeah. take a bit. Um and yeah, it, it was, I was really pleased with variety. I had a couple of solo pieces. I had a solo clarinet piece that I really liked on there. Uh, I had a couple of vocal pieces, uh, some different uh, chamber ensembles. So there's a variety. I had, I think I counted 34 performers involved and they were all so awesome and Aww. so generous with their time. And I had, I think, four different conductors who I was just, like, blown away by because they put so much time into it, and they were so good at their rehearsal techniques and at just bringing everything together. Oh. So it was, it was a big project to organize. Uh, I was de-stressing my goal. I, did this, I think I did this at Butler. I started cooking for all my rehearsals and bringing food. <laughs> I was um, going to mention earlier, the, that's uh, one, maybe that's why I remember what a wonderful rehearsal uh, you were, because you brought the most amazing snacks to rehearsal. <laughs> so the goal for this recital was, first of all, to bake or bring food to every rehearsal and to not repeat the same thing. So I got a whole slew of recipes and made something different for every rehearsal. Um, it was so much fun. That was like the hugest stress really for me. Also, I think it's the most sugar I've eaten. <laughs> <laughs> 
I tell you that I I was gonna speak to you and after that writer cycle I stopped eating sugar for a little while because I just like had enough. Uh, Since stopped, that was like probably a day or two afterwards, and then it was like back to my usual suit. Back to normal. (laughs) Oh well you know Yeah, your cycle was awesome. I was really happy with it. Uh it's all thanks to my performers. Sure. Yeah, so I sure. Really appreciate it. All yeah, that. you know, I've had students mention to me sometimes, oh, well, I can't get these performers or I can't get these musicians because I don't have this or that. I said, you know what? It is so simple. I'll, if you just can feed people, and, and it doesn't have to be elaborate, but I think just something simple, it's more about the thought of how you treat you know, the performers on your recitals, concerts, whatever. So it's a good, it's a really good point to bring up, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Just something simple yeah, so as cooking. Yeah. Like these performers are doing you, I mean, at least here, this was all volunteered. Right. Uh, so they're doing like, me a huge favor, and I'm always amazed that they're so willing and enthusiastic about doing this. Yeah. Speaking of the least I could do is print out parts for them <laughs> and bring them food. Like, Absolutely. Two really easy things on my part. Yeah. And they're always going to want to come back and perform for you just for the small things. And I, I completely remember that, you know, and so it is, it really does matter. So we'll get off, we'll jump off our soapbox now <laughs> and stop lecturing the young students about how to <laughs> treat their performers. Um, so your doctor recital just happened and all went well. Um, are you finishing? So how are you? Where are you in your progress of your DMA? Oh. Is it P- No, I'm sorry, PhD. PhD. Yeah. PhD. So um, actually, this is week 10 right now, and we're on the quarter system, so it's our last week of classes, and we have finals next week. Uh, and this, I guess, is technically my last week of my coursework because wow. I'm finishing up my last required course this term. Uh, so that's happening, and that's really exciting. I just have one last paper to write for that class. Uh, I am probably still going to end up taking classes next term because I like class a lot, and it's really hard for me to imagine not having class. Yes. <laughs> so I, I am enrolled in some. I'm starting to think maybe I should take more research credits instead mm-hmm. because currently I'm in the process of scheduling my first comprehensive exam, right. which if all goes well, it's going to be during the first couple of weeks of next term, which is like a month away. Oh. Uh, I feel like I should probably not overburden myself too much, so I sure. stay for study. Except that I really like classes, and I really want to taste some of the ones being offered next term. So Excellent. I might overwork myself a little bit. Yeah. We'll, see. well, great. But yeah, that's where I am right now. All solid coursework. As of a week from this Friday, I will be done with all my coursework. And then working towards comprehensive exams, and once those are hopefully passed, I'll be working on my dissertation next year. All right, yeah. Um, did you want to talk about that at all, or are you still kind of... Oh, yeah, it's still like, I have actually submitted a proposal, so it's oh, okay. uh, but it's still vague, and I haven't actually okay. sat down and sure. written anything. Yeah. Uh, but I'm planning on doing a... Uh, a what am I saying? A an orchestral song cycle for soprano or mezzo and chamber orchestra, and I'm hoping to use. I actually still have to ask her, uh, but I have a friend Emily Corwin who I attended the College of Worcester with, whose text I've used before in some of my other vocal pieces. Um, but she is this awesome poet. She just had a book published. We should link to that too. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I love her poetry. And she has from her first chapbook this, like, basically it's already in ten movements, but it's kind of this retelling, more like gothic, dark retelling of a fairy tale-ish. But in this one, like, the princess saves the prince. And it's really cool, and I love the way she writes. So I'm hoping to use her text for my dissertation. Uh, And yeah, that's what's coming up next year. I'm super excited to start working on it. Yeah. just getting through the exams and then writing is going to be so much fun next term, next sure. year. Yeah. yeah. And what was her name again? Emily Corwin. Emily uh, Corwin. So okay. You. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll definitely, um, yeah, we'll definitely link to her and get that and get her up there as well. So, um, yeah, so you're quite... Obviously, from talking and, and sharing about things, you're quite the collaborator, it seems to me. I keep I, I do see your um, posts on Facebook and things. 
I noticed that you, even on the East Coast, you have um, quite a few performances and, and I see lots of activity. How is that going for you? Are, you? are these friends from the past? Are you making lots of new connections? How are those working for you? A lot of them have been newer connections. So I mentioned the Walden School earlier, which is where I went for six summers as a student. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been lucky enough, starting in 2016, I started to return as faculty. And first of all, that experience has been so cool. It has, I feel like I have grown so much as a teacher from working there and teaching composition, and the students there are incredible. It's it's like my dream camp to work at. So it's really fun. Nice. Uh, but as part of that, there's a faculty commissioning project. So they bring in some, a different ensemble every year, uh, and they commission faculty members to write for them. So my first year, I wrote for the Quince Contemporary Vocal Ensemble, who's a group of four women uh, who commissioned a ton of new works, and I wrote a piece for them called Three Erasures, which is one of the pieces that used Emily's text. Nice. Uh, and through them, they have since performed that work multiple times, which I'm super lucky about. They also are, that's the CD I was telling you about. That's, they're including, oh, okay. um, they're including it on their new CD, which is coming out April 6th. And it's a, a CD that has all music by women. It's going to be super cool. I feel really spoiled to be part of it. Oh. Um, I'm really lucky. But through them, I also... One of the members, the director, is named Kelly Butcher, and I have since worked with her on both she and pianist Christopher Norlock have been doing what's called the, they call it the Schoenberg Project, where she's been performing um, the Book of the Hanging Gardens, mm -hmm. and they commissioned 15 other composers to each write a piece to go with one of the movements. So I wrote a piece for that with her, and then um, she also asked me we were, she was performing on Resident Bodies Festival in New York last mm -hmm. September, mm -hmm. and she was doing a set on there and asked me to write a piece for her for that. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, Walden has been a source of great connections through Quinza and through Kaylee, and then last summer in 2017, I wrote for Splinter Reeves, who's a Reed Quintet, mm -hmm. and uh, the piece I wrote for them, they have also since performed around more so on the West Coast and I think in Texas mm -hmm. as well. So I've been I've been lucky in the people I've met at Walden and that those connections continue to last past Walden. That's incredible. That's really good. Yeah. I love I love it. For a lot, but no. it's been so so cool to work with. Yeah. Um so talking about the CD featuring women composers, um, obviously this being an anthology of women composers, um, we've been just chatting about um, the fact that we are women composers. I wanted to ask you, um, how much does that come across to your mind? What do you think about, is it a factor for you, is it not? What do you, and what do you think about um, all of the activity that has been happening over the last few years, you know, with the women's movement through classical music, particularly in our field of composition? Uh, I think the movements that are happening are really cool. Uh, I, I think I'm becoming more and more aware of it and thinking of myself more as more as a woman in music. And I... Personally, for myself, I think it started off with a piece that I wrote for Quince, but I've been looking, I've been trying really hard when I incorporate text especially to be using text by women and to try to bring in more artwork, more text by women, uh, kind of as my own way of exploring all of that. But I think, I was at, actually recently, last two weeks ago, I was at a, a festival, um, the Music by Women Festival, which yeah. is the second year in Mississippi. And the director in her opening remarks would have made this really great comment that she was saying that um, that festivals like that shouldn't have to happen. Everyone mm -hmm. should be equal, but yes. up until there's more equality uh, in music that is represented on concerts, festivals and things like the databases are really, really essential to bring more awareness that this music is out there. Uh, and I think that's such a great point, since ideally we wouldn't have to have so much out there in terms of just broadcasting women's music, but I think at this point we need it. 
so I think all the movements, I love the site, um, the music theory examples by women. Have you seen that site? That's oh, cool. uh, I don't think I have. What, what, what was that again? I, I, I think if you just type, I think it's music theory examples by women. Okay. It's just it's one of the things I was in a theory pedagogy class last term. And we were talking, just going through the textbooks and like looking, doing broad survey of textbooks. And that's one of the things I noticed is that, especially for like women from past eras, when you look at textbooks, there might be one example by Clara Schumann and maybe one by Fanny Hensel, but there's like no music by women represented in textbooks. Wow. Uh, and that's one of the pet peeves for me is that I started looking through that, and since I was aware and looking at it, I was like, whoa. What if I was a freshman again and I wanted and I was interested in composition like that would totally shoot me down. Um, yeah. So what I was trying to do in like our practice teaching was just bring in more examples by women since I think that's really important in theory classes. <laughs> it's really that is a really good point. Um, in one of our most recent interviews with Amber Beams, who I believe you remember from Butler as well, we were there together. Um, she now works at J.W. Pepper Music, and yeah. and she uh, we were talking about all of the music that she sees on a daily basis that comes in for the shelves, and how very little of it's represented by women. And I think the comment about the textbooks that really hadn't thought about that that much, to be honest with you. I mean, we I'm that's really uh, something to think about. Um, so fascinating. Well, we'll definitely yeah. we'll definitely feature that as well. So I'm I'm interested as in myself. So to to look at that. So great. Um. So the future. What is? What, tell us what do you want to do. What's what are your hopes, your plans, your dreams? What are you going to compose? Are actually are you actually before we skip there? Are you working on what are you working on comp composition wise right now? Uh, let's see, I am just finishing up a, I was working on this project called the Creative Commissions Project, and that is uh, spearheaded by Andy Villamez, I probably pronounced his last name wrong, so I apologize, uh, but it's in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, it's a project where essentially he got several, I think there were like five or six composers involved, and he paired us each uh, young piano students, so students ages like six to high school age could apply for this program and as composers we each got paired with a couple of students and we Skyped with them, got to know what they were working on and we wrote pieces for them, uh, which was really, really fun since when I was at Butler I used to teach uh, piano students that age. So getting to work with them, I worked with three girls uh, all around third grade, all pretty early and I got to Skype them and their teachers and see what they're working on and what their interests were. Aww. So I ended up writing uh, one piece about a unicorn <laughs> and um, one piece about like the waltzes in like the antebellum south of like the big ball gowns and then one piece that was just supposed to be crazy. Oh. Um, so it was it was a really, really fun project and it was so like lighthearted and not mm. Like, I had fun writing the pieces, and they were fast to write. Sure. Um, so that has been really fun. I'm hoping to go out for the premiere in May to actually like, get to hear them perform. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's been fun. So that's been finishing that up. Um, I I think this is happening. Two of my parents, I teach second-year keyboard skills right now. Okay. And two of my students uh, have asked me if I would write them a duet for a flute this soon. Oh. So assuming they were serious, and I think they were since they brought it up multiple times, I'm hoping to write that for them next. Oh, nice. um, it is a fun combination, and I like my students a lot, so Aww. I think them. Yeah. Uh, it's coming up next, and then there are some other projects that are kind of like floating that aren't totally tangible yet, but mm -hmm. they're, they're coming up. Great. Competitions, festivals, presentations? Uh, nothing. Coming up right now, I'm trying to think. Uh, I did present last December with two of my friends in Georgia at mm -hmm. a conference. It was called the Research on Contemporary Composition Conference. Mm -hmm. um, it was in its first year, so very early. But the three of us presented on the importance of composing new works for uh, more educational based ensembles, 
mm -hmm. or ensembles of amateur musicians. Yeah. Since when he, we had all been at Oregon for two years together, so the people I present with, Evan Harger, who is a conductor who's now working on a PhD in yeah. conducting at the uh, Michigan State University, mm -hmm. I believe. Uh, and then Martin Kirov is another composer. And while Evan had been here, we had been working, he had been in charge of the University of Oregon Campus Orchestra, which is open, is on audition, it's open to anyone in the community. Mm -hmm. And we, he had commissioned me to write a piece for them that basically introduced them to aleatoric techniques mm -hmm. of any sort and like extended techniques on the strings, while also having like a melody and harmony at some point. So I did that, it was a really cool experience. I introduced, there's like some graphic notation on there, some traditional notation, but essentially, and Martin did something similar, so we mm -hmm. took all of that and turned it into a project of like, here's some tips you can do to bring new music to new, like to younger ensembles or to amateur ensembles. Sure. Uh, so I did on that, it was really cool, it was fun. Nice, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so that was the most recent presentation. Great. Um, so, what do you think when you're finished with your dissertation and you get that wonderful PhD? Are you you think you since you you've traveled from east to clear to west coast? Do you have any indications of where you'd like to end up? Do you want to go back to the east coast? Are you missing home? Uh, well, I my goal is to get a teaching job. Sure. So currently, my answer is that I will gladly go anywhere where I'm offered a job. Uh, however, <laughs> if I could have like my ideal world, I would love to get like I would love to get a job at a small liberal arts school somewhere in New England, like Western Massachusetts, Vermont. That would be my ideal dream job. Uh, however, I am very flexible and I am happy to live anywhere. Um, I travel easily. I like learning new places, so I'd be willing to go anywhere and to really work with any type of student. Can I ask you if you want to share about your trip from when you traveled from Massachusetts to Oregon over the <laughs> summer? I have to tell you have to tell the story. I love yes. this. So the fact that this is that I really like road trips and I like long road trips. Uh, so when I was moving to Oregon from Massachusetts, uh, I packed up all of my stuff in my Subaru to the point where my car could fit me. And then the seat next to me was like my cooler and my day-to-day -day things, and I had a roof rack. And then I basically plotted my way across the country based on where I knew people. So I was going from Massachusetts to Ohio. Uh, but along the planning process, I found out I was having a piece being performed in Florida. So I think it was around the time I was already planning on driving to Oregon. So I just figured I'd drive to Florida. So I ended up going like Massachusetts to Ohio, uh, down through, I think I stopped in North Carolina, down to Florida, to Tennessee, to Missouri, to Colorado. No, oh, I stopped in Kansas too. Kansas, Colorado, Utah, Idaho, Oregon, something like that. So, yeah. I loved it. I had so much fun with that trip. And you um, were I alone. Was... You were alone, well, right? You were all alone. Yeah, it was so much fun. <laughs> I, I loved it. Podcasts. Uh, it was great. And I also, for me, like I have realized my ideal, like my perfect length for a car ride is eight hours. Mm -hmm. So most of my trips were exactly eight hours or right around right. there. So right. it's like it gives you time to like drive for four hours, stop once, get gas, eat your food, and drive for the second half. I completely uh, so agree. Perfect. It is perfect. It is. Well, is there anything that we missed? Um, we need to talk about, you know, how people can find you before we go. So your website is? Oh, uh, cxomusic.com or chatsomusic. Okay. All right. And are you are on SoundCloud or? I am on SoundCloud. Uh, I, I think I'm just Kara Haxo. I'm the only Kara Haxo. Sure. <laughs> You're, as, as always, you are unique. So, <laughs> wonderfully, yeah, wonderfully. I'm SoundCloud, I have my website. Mm -hmm. I think those are the two main sources you can find me at. Okay, Twitter I or... Yeah. I have an Instagram, I don't have Twitter. Okay, yeah, I have yeah. great. Follow okay. me on Instagram, yeah. though I don't post very often. <laughs> All right, well, Karen.
Sarah, this has just been wonderful. I've loved reconnecting with you. I miss your real face, but I'm just so happy for uh, the experience you've had out in Oregon. We've been so proud of you back, uh, th those of us that know you, and uh, just can't wait to see where you end up <laughs> after. Oh, so thank you for having me. This is, I still, I will say it again, this is such a cool project, and I'm so oh. excited like all the other videos well too. thanks i i'm the lucky one i've just been having a good time connecting with uh old friends and new making new friends and so it's just been a it's just been a wonderful time so i really appreciate it well we're gonna again link to all of the things that we can and uh this will be on youtube so we just appreciate it and uh get to know kara listen to her music perform her music share her music um, give it to other people and uh, spread the goodness. So thanks, Kara. Thank you.